Today we're going to read about a group of wise men who traveled from an ancient land in search of the King of the Jews, in search of the Savior of the world. These wise men are known as Magi. These ancient stargazers travel uh, and follow a star which leads them straight to Bethlehem. So will you join me this morning as we follow the journey of the Magi, which is found in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Can I get everyone to please stand? Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, for when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you. We do thank you for this story of the Magi, Lord, of these wise men going and looking for the Savior of the world. Lord, we thank you that it wasn't just a story of the past, but it is a story for all time. That Jesus the Savior is to be sought by all men. Lord, help us to seek him not with our minds, but also with our hearts, Lord. And we thank you once again, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Now, many of the scholars that are out there believe that the Magi, or the wise men, that they came from Babylon. And, and if that's true, then that means it probably took them several months, if not a year or two, to get from Babylon to Bethlehem. That's because they couldn't travel like we do today. For example... John and Tammy Arnold just uh, got back from New Zealand. You know how far, hey, amen, amen. Let's give them a congratulations. They're, they're really well. Now, Tammy would be here, but she had uh, sh soldier, shoulder, soldier surgery, shoulder surgery, and uh, she's home recovering from that. So make sure we pray for, for her as well. But it's 7,100 miles from Portland to New Zealand. And yet it didn't take them years to get there. It didn't take them months to get there. It didn't take them weeks to get there. It didn't even take them days to get there. It took them less than 24 hours to get from Portland to New Zealand. If only the Magi had a private jet. Amen? <laughs> now the reason I bring this up or the point I'm trying to make is that this was no easy journey that they were on. In fact, it would require a rather large entourage to be able to bring the supplies that they would need, the food and stuff like that. Uh, it would require a lot of money, and like I said, it would also require a, a lot of time. It wasn't like going to the Festival of Lights in Portland at the Grotto. I mean, have any of you ever been to the Festival of Lights, the Grotto in Portland? 
They, they have about 160 uh, concerts there, Christmas concerts there. They have a half a million Christmas lights set up. It's supposed to be one of the most amazing Christmas light shows. But you know what? I didn't see anybody's hand come up. And so it kind of tells you something. It tells you that, that that's really something you can take or leave. It's an option. But you know what? When the Magi set out for Bethlehem, it was not an option for them. And it was not some simple two-hour trip like the trip to Portland to see the Festival of Lights. In fact, it was the most significant event of their lifetime. And let me say this as well. It is the most significant event in human history. It was historical, but not really historical in the way that, that we normally think of historical. For example, John Glenn, we just lost uh, astronaut John Glenn uh, recently. In fact, they had his memorial service. And if you were watching TV at all yesterday, you probably saw it on the news. John Glenn was the third man and the first American to go into outer space. He was the first man or first person to ever orbit the Earth. In fact, it was considered at the time to be one of the most uh, historical events as far as aviation goes in American history. It was history but it did not reach the same level of significance of Jesus Christ coming into our world. It was historical. Now, the other thing I want to say is that a lot of these astronauts are gone. In fact, John Glenn was known as part of the, the first group of astronauts. They're called the first astronauts, and every one of them are gone. Even Neil Armstrong. How many of you remember Neil Armstrong? He was the first man to ever walk on the moon, and he's gone. But what they did is not forgotten. They may be gone, but they are not forgotten. And what they did is not forgotten. But let me say it one more time. As significant as what they did is, it's not nearly as significant as, as God sending his son to be born on this earth. Now, last week I talked about the importance of having perspective. If you remember right, I talked about how perspective helps us to understand what's truly important in life. Let me show you, based on what I just said, let me show you how perspective works. What's more important, going to see a light show in Portland at the Grotto, or man going into outer space, or man walking on the moon? Which is more important? I think most of us would have to say man going into outer space, man walking on the moon. That's perspective. That's what perspective does for you. It helps you to see what's most important. Now let's do that one more time. What's more important, man going into outer space, man walking on the moon, or God sending his son to this earth? You know what? Going into outer space is pretty cool. I think just about every boy dreamed of going into outer space. That's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty significant. But you know what? It's not nearly as significant, or it doesn't rise to the same level of significance as God sending a savior to our world. And that's far more important. Let me say this as well. The more wisdom you have, the better your perspective will be. Let me say that one more time. The more wisdom you have, the better your perspective will be. Now these magi were wise men. See, they were wise enough to recognize that God had placed this star in the sky and they followed that star star straight to Jesus. They sought Jesus. And let me tell you something this morning. Wise men and women still seek Jesus today. I said wise men and women still seek Jesus today. Like I said, wisdom gives us perspective. The more wisdom we have, the better our perspective is. And that's why wisdom is so important. In Proverbs 2, verses 2 through 5, it says, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. <clears throat> for if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. <clears throat> if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Now let me say this. I don't believe that wisdom is the same thing as understanding. I don't think wisdom is the same thing as experience. 
That's because you can have understanding, you can have knowledge, and you can have experience and still not have wisdom. I mean, all of you, you have somebody in your life who's really smart, or you have somebody in your life who's got a lot of life experience, but they do really, really stupid things. I mean, you watch and you go, man, why would you do that? I mean, anybody with, with half a brain wouldn't do that. I mean, anybody with wisdom wouldn't do that. And so you can have knowledge, you can have understanding, and you can have experience, but that doesn't guarantee that you'll be wise. Now, here's what I think wisdom is. I think wisdom is a combination of knowledge and experience and faith in God. I think it's a combination of all three of those things. I mean, wisdom doesn't really matter if you don't end up in heaven, amen? It really doesn't matter at all. And the beautiful thing about wisdom is that anybody can have it. Wisdom isn't just for the intellectual. Wisdom isn't just for the rich, the wealthy. It isn't for the powerful or for the influential only. Wisdom is available to every one of us. How do we know that? We know that because of James 1.5, where James says this. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so all we have to do is what? Yes. Ask. All of us can have wisdom. All we have to do is ask, and it says that God will give it to us. You know, as we think about these wise men, you want to know one of the reasons that they were wise men? It was despite the fact that they were men, they asked for directions. <laughs> when they got to Jerusalem, they pulled into the local camel garage and they asked for directions. Most men don't do that, do they? Most men would rather die than ask for directions. And so they were wise men because they asked for directions. And so don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn. Don't just ask for wisdom. But guys, ask for directions. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Y'all know who I'm talking about. He's the one driving all over town with that deer in the headlight look. His wife looks over at him and she says, you're a lost, aren't you? He says, no, I'm not. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm taking a shortcut. And the whole time he's driving and doing that, he's praying desperately. Praying, God help me. He's praying that if he drives long enough, eventually that place is, is going to just ma magically show up. And then he can turn to his wife and say, see, I told you I know where I was going. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. That's, that's letting pride drive the car and not your brain. And so ask for directions. You know, asking for directions is the beginning of wisdom. Actually, it's not. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? Amen. And I think asking for directions has to be like next in line or something like that. Now, these wise men were looking for Jesus, the Messiah. Can anybody tell me how many wise men... How do we know? How do we know? We don't know. No, there's three gifts that gold represents a myrrh, so we assume that there were three. That's we assume. We don't know, but we assume because three gifts were given. But I want to. You want to be real here? We don't know. There could have been two. There could have been ten. Now we know there was a large group because, like I said, they made this long journey, and we we don't know how many of these people were wise men. But the assumption, the reason why you see three, is exactly what Francis said, is because three gifts were given. Now here's something else that maybe you haven't caught. In fact, I hate to say this, but most of our nativity seeds are wrong. And that is the other thing you didn't catch that maybe you haven't caught is that when the magi, the wise men, came to visit Jesus. He wasn't an infant. He wasn't a newborn baby. You know, what we have to understand, when the wise men came to visit, it wasn't at the same time that the shepherds came to visit. You remember the story of the shepherds. The shepherds are out in the field. They're watching their sheep. When all of a sudden, angels show up. And they tell them about Jesus. And so they go immediately to Bethlehem. And they find Jesus, a brand new baby, in a manger. Different timeline. And we know that, especially because of verse 11, 
And verse 11 basically tells us that the wise men went not to a manger, but to a house. Did you catch that when we read that today? Not to a manger, but to a house. It seemed that enough time had elapsed between the visit of the shepherds until the magic come, that Mary and Joseph and Jesus were now living in a house. Now, many scholars believe that Jesus was probably about two years old, that he was a toddler when the Magi came to visit. And that's what I believe, too. And there are several reasons that, that they come to that conclusion and that I come to that conclusion. Um, the first one is, if you noticed in verse 1, it says, after Jesus was born. It says, after. And so it tells us it's not at the same time. Uh, another reason that we believe that is because Herod asked the Magi when the star appeared. And that presume, that assumes um, that that's when Jesus was born. And when you add the fact in the, that Jesus was in a house now, you add to the fact that it probably took them several months, if not a year or two, to get there. And then on top of all that, which isn't in our story, but you probably know it, when Herod found out that Jesus was born, what did he do later on? He tried to kill all the male children that were two years and under. So why two years? Because that's when the star appeared. That's when the star appeared. And so that's why I think when you add all that information up, it just really, um, I think it's convincing that Jesus was probably a toddler. Probably a toddler. Now, the one thing we have to ask, I mean, I'm sure you're thinking it right now, is why would Herod want to kill Jesus? Why would anyone want to kill a baby, a toddler? Why though? I mean, what kind of a threat can a little baby be? Can you throw a baby rattle at you or something like that? What kind of threat is that? King of the Jews. Yeah. You're going to get to it. You're going to get to it. The answer comes actually in verse 2. It says, Where is he who has been born, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Robert nailed it. That, that statement right there is it. King of the Jews, for we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, something you probably don't know is that the Roman Senate, you have to remember the Romans were the dominant power of that day. They were the dominant power of that day. And the Roman Senate had given Herod the Great the title King of the Jews. King of the Jews. And so Jesus was a threat to his authority. He was a threat to Herod's rule. And so Herod must have been thinking, you know what? There can't be two king of the Jews. There can only be one. If that means one of us must go, and it's not going to be me, so it's going to be Jesus. Even if he's a baby, I don't care. I'm going to get rid of him. I think somebody, I think Francis said it. Get rid of him before he grows up and becomes a threat, not only to my rule, but to my children. I think he had at least four sons that were also in line to be king and were leading in different areas as well. And so he's going to get rid of Jesus. He's going to get rid of the threat. Now, obviously, we know that didn't happen. Uh, Joseph was warned by an angel in a dream to leave, and he's able to leave. You know, one of the things that I really admire about the Bible, that I admire about this story in particular, is all the prophecies surrounding the different events. Prophecies about the star, prophecies about the wise men, prophecy about the gift. Prophecies about where Jesus was going to be born. Prophecies about what Herod was going to do in Bethlehem. For example, over in Jeremiah 31, 15, and this is about 600 years before Jesus was born. 600 years before Jesus was born. It says, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping, weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Because they are no more. And so that was prophesied in advance. Another prophecy that was done in advance, probably about five or six hundred years as well, was Micah 5.2. It says, But as for you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And that's really a profound prophecy because not only does it tell us exactly where Jesus was going to be born, 
But it, it did it hundreds of years in advance. And on top of that, it gives us a hint of Jesus' deity. Notice it says, from the days of eternity. In other words, Jesus has always existed, which is exactly what the Bible says. Now check this one out. Numbers 24, 17 was almost 1,500 years before Jesus was born. And it tells us about this star that the wise men would follow. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Well, of course, it's 1,500 years. He, he realized, even as it was being prophesied, that this was going to be a long time in the future. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. Now, this star was actually more like a satellite than what we think of a star. This star actually moved with the earth, and it stopped right over Bethlehem. I mean, how many stars do you see do that today? That sounds more like a satellite. We see the satellites up there, and we can make them stop wherever we want. But the problem is... They didn't have any satellites back then. They didn't have any satellites back then. And so this was a supernatural event. This was a star that God created specifically for this event. You realize that even the gifts, at least two of the gifts are mentioned also about 600 years in advance. In Isaiah 60, verse 6, it says, A multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those of Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense. You catch this? And will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. You know, it's just amazing how much is there. Let me just say this right now. These wise men were not following some story created for man. They weren't following some myth like the fountain of youth. They weren't following some myth like King Solomon's minds. They were following a star that God had created just for this occasion. They were following hundreds of prophecies that had been prophesied for hundreds of years about this event at this exact time in history. Now check out Romans 5.6. Romans 5.6 says you see at just the right time. You see at just the right time. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time. I've told you guys this before. Some of you probably haven't heard this. But it was at the exact perfect time in human history that Jesus came. For one thing, the Romans were in authority. They had been in, in authority for about 600 years total. Uh, probably about half mark, halfway mark here, or a little bit less. And there was what was known as the Pax. Romana, and that's known as the Roman peace. That's one thing the Romans did. They ruled for about 600 years, and during their reign, there really wasn't any other authority, and what they did is they made it safe to travel. Because if you did things wrong, they had Roman crosses all over the place for people who robbed and stuff like that, so it was safe to travel. But even before that, we had... Alexander the Great, I think he reigned from 333 to 323 B.C., and so he was the dominant power before the Romans, but even though his kingdom only lasted about 10 years, he was able to conquer the known world, and what he did was he took uh, the Greek culture and he transplanted it all over the known world, and part of that was the Greek language, the Greek language known as Koine Greek, and so don't let it be a surprise that our New Testament is written in what language? The Koine Greek, the original language in Koine Greek. Why? Because there was one universal language that people knew. And so God could take it out and communicate his word. And so you add all the prophecies into this, and you add to the fact that the Bible was written over 1,500 years by over 40 different authors. It was written on three different continents in three different languages. And yet it is uh, one story from beginning to end. It is his story. You know what that should do? That should give you an awful lot of confidence in God's word. When you put all these pieces together, you realize that this book is not man's book. This book is God's word. And you should have confidence in this book. Amen? Amen. You know what? When you put this all together, what it should really tell you is it matters how we celebrate Christmas. Now, Christmas may be a national holiday in America, but let me tell you something this morning. It is so much more than that. See, Christmas represents 
hope to a fallen world. Christmas represents God's love. It represents God's peace. But to be able to see this, we have to have wisdom. And so that's probably why we have the story about the wise men in the Bible. So that we can understand that Christmas isn't about pageantry. It's a matter of wisdom. It's a matter of wisdom. Wisdom sees past the superstition of Christmas. Let me say that one more time to make sure you get it. Wisdom sees past the superstition of Christmas. Now when I say the superstition of Christmas, I'm talking about that chubby guy in a red suit with a bunch of reindeer. See, wisdom sees past that and it sees the Christ child born to bring uh, peace to man. But it takes wisdom to be able to see that. And you know what? We see wisdom in action as we see those three wise men when they see Jesus. What do they do? They bow down and they worship him. So let me say this this morning. Wise men and women not only seek Jesus, but they worship Jesus.